of it, but. I think the, the, I, it's really more the general idea. And I think we, you know, we have a little bit of latitude to tweak it. The concept was really just to be sure that we had a tool for considering the, the community values as we work through a lot of important decisions. And Sue created this, this as a tool for us to use to do so. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, <laughs> problem with some adapta adaptations to the tool so that it's more useful for the specific purpose that we're, we're intending to use it for. Um, but that's really the idea was just to, it's, it could be easy to lose those, that work that happened in the fall um, mm -hmm. and critical not to lose that work. So um, I think that was all that was about was to try and keep that in the forefront. Yeah, I, 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 I... I think it will be helpful for that purpose. Jeff, you said that you attended quite a few of the communicate the community involvement sessions with Sue. Yes, that was my recollection. So yes, yeah. So a lot. Of, I mean, it's it's a good summary of the highlights that she captured, or the, you know, the, the communicate communications group captured out of um, those meetings. Yeah, I, I thought so too. Kevin, I'm going to sort of, you'll still see me, but I'm going to step away and might have to take my audio and video off for a minute. I'm going to try and reach out to John and just see if there's a hiccup with him getting in or what the issue might be so that we're going to have him go. Okay. Okay. I think it's a good tool. I don't know. Do we have to do an action item on it or is it all? I, I made it an action item, particularly if the discussion involved modifications. I think we should have some consensus on the modifications. Um, you know, if, it, if everybody is agreeable to that, that it's a good yardstick as it sets, then I'm I'm not exactly sure how formal we need to get get with it, you know. Are we trying to be have like when we are using this tool, are we all having the exact same like we think that is a seven because that it's a long range about what the scales are. So I don't I mean, which is fine, but I'm just curious if that if we are going to be using this tool and then reporting out on where as a group we fell on the scale is it you know a group decision on that which is fine by me but so how i mean how does everybody else feel about how to calibrate i thought one and uh, one way it might be interesting to use is if, if we eat it kind of is a quantitative confirmation of a qualitative process and I thought if we each came up with our own ideas of where we were and then we plotted each person's response for example on academic excellence and see where the group comes out maybe sometimes we would we would be all closely aligned maybe sometimes we would be all over the place and then we'd have to talk about the all over the place responses more and it would give us a quantitative background against which to have those discussions. I like it. Josh, you have any thoughts? I, I agree with that assessment. I mean, it's really, you know, it's just a tool and, and I think it should be calibrated as if we start to find a wide array of responses, but um, it's a good starting point and, and just the fact that it was uh, responsive to the 2019 meetings is, is a great start. Which is a long way of saying, I, I really, I wouldn't adjust it at this time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I, I think that seems to be the sentiment. I think I, I would, from my point of view, I would rather people look at it with their set of values, if you will, and if, and that will drive the skews or the variances that would, would um, fodder the discussion as opposed to trying to come up with uh, something to guide us to to mark it up, if you will.
Katrina. I wonder too about when you start using it, maybe just do a couple at a time, because it seems to me that there's a lot that can be unpacked in terms of the language, right? So to come to some sort of an agreement on how you're defining you know, some of the vocabulary that's in here could be a rich conversation that you wouldn't want to have with all of them in one meeting, I wouldn't think. That's true. And you, you and I, the thing that kind of tricked my mind, at least when you, you started that, just started saying that is there, there's, there's going to be a multiple of uh, options to use this thing. You could, you could end up with a whole matrix of points and, and, and chartings, as I suppose. Go ahead, Josh, if you have something to say. No, nope, not at this time. I'm, I'm trying to get uh, the video feed running as, as well. So don't, as, I don't, I don't have it. Unfortunately, I don't have any, have, have anything to, anything to add at this time. Uh, that's fine. I saw your, your bar, your, uh, your box light up. I was just wondering. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Not a problem. Kevin, do you want a motion or not? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how you feel. I, I'm comfortable with just leaving it as a working, an informal working document. I think there's enough consensus that we, we just use it and go ahead. But. Agreed. I can get pretty sloppy sometimes with this kind of stuff, I suppose. Um, you want yeah, to I mean, you're, you, you may have, you may have one, one set of questions that deviate from this tool and we may need to create more. So I, I wouldn't stay married for, to it to the whole, I mean, it's a good, it's a good set of, questions so we'll want to stay consistent to it but I, w I don't think we should shy away from adding or even modifying the questions as we move along well um i don't know that, that along with the inter the discussion with kennedy were pretty much the primary things i don't know if anybody's been really grinding their gears between the last meeting and this one of of uh, the meaning of life or anything with this topic. <laughs> Kevin, before I move on from that piece of it, do you want to have an action or a motion that just says we're going to use this as a working document or a work or a dynamic tool or something to guide in our decisions? Is that, do you want that or no? I. I think, you know, maybe if if um, you can just say there's a general consensus to use it and that we will modify it as necessary through the process. Does that make sense? Yep. Is everybody that happy with that? Yep. Mm Well, I'm not much of a conversationalist, so <laughs> I, I married one, so I don't have to say anything. Uh, <laughs> it, could, it might be a short meeting. <laughs> I have other work I can do on a different screen. So, so if you guys don't mind, I'll just go do that for a while. And then if I hear you start talking, I'll come back. Oh, here comes Patrick. So I, uh, my update is I finally got John's cell phone number. So I'm going to call him right now. <laughs> My update is I hope to have an update. Does everyone have their um their gardens in the in the ground yet? Yes. Well, I got a great um a great tip from our facilities guy who used to spend some time at Centennial and with their guy and um soaking grass seed for a couple of days before you put it out takes about mm. 
three or four days off getting grass growing. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Nice. I didn't I didn't do the experiment warm water versus cold water. So if you wanna you wanna go out a little further with it, it's on you. But it, That's it, great it, to know because my, my plow ripped up my lawn. <laughs> uh, that's what I was fixing, a bunch of plow cuts and uh. well, looks like Mr. Kennedy's John Kennedy's here. Yeah, my wife had me uh, building uh, raised beds a couple weeks ago and being an architect, of course, I took it to uh, the nth degree. So uh, that's been my uh, house project the uh, last couple weeks. All right, I think we have John on now. Hello? We're having some video challenges, but I bet we have audio. Can you hear us? Can, can, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so I think we've got you, John. Okay. All right, I don't, the video isn't up yet, but let's, <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know why we can't. It's, it's, if you can't end up seeing me, that's probably better for all of you anyway. <laughs> 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 as long as I can hear you. All right. As long as you can hear me, and, and, and hopefully this will come up within a, a minute or two for some reason I've used it several times but for some reason today it's it's not behaving so uh, as long as you can hear me we can we can start up I don't want to delay you waiting to look at if that's okay with you yeah I think that'll be fine okay huh yeah, yeah. Patrick John knows the, the, the charge or the action of this group and is familiar with who's here or should we do some? He's somewhat familiar with who's here. I think some introductions would be great and then maybe give John a minute to just sort of give an overview of NESDEC and, and the work and then maybe some Q&A. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Okay. Yeah. So, so John, we have a, a, a committee, subcommittee of the board um, school board and um, Patrick's administration is has three members three members I think and we've got a couple community members and two school board members on this group and we're trying to find our way through some challenges that um, you know both the administration and the, the school board as well as the, the voting members of the district are concerned so um, Patrick if you want to introduce your team and then we can just introduce the community members and the board members, I guess. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over. Uh, Katrina, why don't you go first and then Floyd can go next and introduce sort of yourself and your role and um, anything else you might like to, to add. Hi, John, I'm Katrina DiNapoli. I am the assistant superintendent for our district. I'm also a Moncton resident. So in the five towns, I've had kids go through the schools. Thank you for joining us. Okay. John, I'm Floyd Davison. I'm the um, business manager for the district. I'm a Bristol resident. I'm doing my darndest to keep kids in our school system. Um, and, and I'm really glad to have a chance to chat a little bit about this. Okay. And by that, he means literally. Mm -hmm. uh, Floyd has many children, and we are thankful for every one of them. Oh, well, that's great. Patrick, you're, you're. Oh, I'm superintendent, Patrick Green. We've talked on the phone a couple of times, so thanks for yeah. being here. Yeah. Then Jeff. Okay. I'm Jeff Miller. I'm a community member. I live in Lincoln. Uh, my children did not go through the five um, towns schools. I am a mentor of a fourth grader, uh, currently a mentor of a fourth grader in Lincoln. Oh. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Josh? Uh, I am a uh, another community member. I live in Bristol. I went through the system first through Moncton and then at uh, seven and eight uh, at Mount Abe. Uh, I am also an architect at Freeman French Freeman. Hey. Yeah. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Lapearl. I'm a board member I did Act 46 
with um, the school district back in the day. And I'm, I have, I live in New Haven. I have kids in the school district and I actually am a science teacher in a different school district. Ah, okay. And I'm, I'm Kevin Hanson. I'm on the board. I'm a relative newcomer. I've been on the, um, I've been involved with school boards probably a year and a half, maybe two years now. And um, I'm a Bristol, Bristol resident. Um, my wife and I went to Mount Abe or through the five Mount Abe Unified District schools, as well as our daughters. So, uh, we've been hanging around for a while. <laughs> okay. All right. Any others? That's it. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm uh, John Kennedy and I'm with uh, NESDEC, New England School Development Council. And uh, I first of all want to take this opportunity to compliment the district for engaging in an in-depth uh, planning analysis that considers key factors that you folks are going to be looking at uh, that will have an impact on your future long-term planning. That's a great move on your part to be going into the depth of this analysis uh, before you make key decisions. And uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, some districts don't do that. And uh, so it's a very uh, important move on your part. Um, and uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize and compliment the superintendent and the team uh, for his assistance and leadership in organizing uh, the steps in the process thus far. It's been very helpful and uh, helped to clarify the uh, info related to the uh, goals of the project and, and uh, the process and that uh, made it uh, very helpful to us as we were moving forward. I also want to compliment the school board members and community members who are participating. Uh, I think it's great that uh, you are willing to take the time to do the research and, and uh, to participate and share your thoughts uh, in these very important uh, decision-making processes that I had, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a great move. Um, we, today, I'm going to just uh, try to uh, go through with you the information on the project uh, that we have, have uh, just engaged in and give you some details of the process and then I'd be happy to take any questions that you have once, once I get through it. And uh, just to, I'm going to try to give you some of the major points that are um, a part of the process. So uh, first of all, just briefly, uh, some information about NESDEC. Uh, NESDEC is the New England School Development Council. It originated um, over 70 years ago out of the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education. And um, it is currently a nonprofit organization which operates out of Marlboro, Massachusetts. Uh, and um, it's uh, interesting, uh, this past year, 2019, uh, we had over uh, 250 member districts uh, in the organization. And um, the, uh, they are throughout New England. And one of the things we're really pleased about is that over 50% of those districts have been members of the organization for over 10 years. And so that that tells us that they're uh, feeling that the services that they are receiving are, uh, you know, very effective and helpful to them. And with regard to um, the services that we do provide, uh, we are involved with executive searches for districts, for superintendencies, or for principalships. We uh, assist districts with strategic planning. But we also are involved, and this is where I'm particularly assisting with uh, members of my team, with uh, annual enrollment projections. We do over 200 and 
80 sets of enrollment projections each year for districts throughout the uh, New England area. And also uh, demographic studies. And these occur when it's very, when a district is going to be making some very important decisions based on enrollment. And so we look at factors that could be affecting enrollments down the road. And lastly, we do facility best use studies, which we are also going to be working on with you folks. So over the course of uh, the next uh, few months, uh, all of those will be combined. And uh, after we uh, communicate with the district's leadership and the leadership team, uh, we will then uh, typically present a final uh, analysis or a final project. And, and the project will include a demographic analysis. And uh, we're going to start working on that very soon. And the demographic will an analysis will uh, analyze factors that are likely to have an impact on your enrollments over the course of the next uh, several years. And the key factors that come into play there are uh, births, obviously, those children born this year are most likely to be part of your K class in uh, five years down the road. And so that's a very important factor, uh, those that are born within the district. But also uh, there are move-ins and there, are, uh, there is new construction. So we always are asking the district for information and we will be receiving that from our contacts for each of the member communities, government contacts, who would be able to provide us with permitting history uh, for primarily single families in small towns, but also if there's anything in the works with regard to condominiums or anything in the works with regard to uh, apartments. And um, so we get usually in touch with the either the building or planning departments in each of the communities based on the recommendation of the superintendent. And uh, he provides us with the contacts. And, you know, in terms of condos or things like that, typically you're not going to see uh, a lot of that construction in your area. But if you did, uh, many people might say, well, you know, most most uh, parents and uh, with children aren't going to be living in a in a condo, but the other side of the story is multiple multiple uh, folks in the sixty and over group are selling single families in order to uh, move into a condo, and, and so that's a factor that does come into play if that is and we also ask for recommendations for contacts for local realtors so that we can get an indicator of existing home sales within each of the five communities and that will give us some other detail we take all of that information along with information from the uh, town governments with regard to any potential zoning changes or any potential major changes in employment, uh, either employers coming or going. And those factors are then uh, factored in to the adjusted enrollment projections. And the enrollment projections are based on information we receive from the district and also information that we may be able to get from the state and those uh, will be, be uh, typically the enrollment projections are on a grade level basis and they go out over a 10-year uh, period from the startup. And uh, along with them, there are other details which we provide which tend to be helpful to the, uh, to the districts. So you'll be getting those and those are a part of the uh, project. And that way you'll have some, some key information in terms of what does the future look like with your enrollment growth or lack of growth. And then the other piece is a, the facility study. That's the last part. 
And so you can see where we're heading here. It's very important to know what's the enrollment future look like, but it's also extremely important to know what is the capacity of each of the school buildings. And we base that on a process that has been tremendously effective in terms of analyzing student capacity based on grade level uh, maximum class size numbers, but also based on the ability of the facility to meet current and future programming needs. And obviously within a district, it is, and we've read your studies and, and your reports, the superintendent has done that. And we've, we've read the information on several of those, uh, and we will be looking at them as we go through. And we can see that, um, you know, there, there are some uh, definite factors that, that come into play. Uh, communities wanting a uh, school within their town or, and, and so on and so forth, but also, uh, we also know that uh, you folks have emphasized equity and therefore equity of programming. And so our facility analysis is based on multiple factors and uh, we will be providing that information to you in the facility study and we will provide you with what we call a current operating capacity of the building and also a planned operating capacity, which takes into consideration, for example, it probably doesn't occur in your district, but in some cases we see uh, students who are receiving uh, physical therapy uh, in the hallway on a mattress or something along those lines, which is not suitable. And uh, in many instances, we see that uh, small group instruction may be occurring in converted closets. And, and so any of those situations, we would make an adjustment to the school's capacity in order to accommodate uh, programming. And then we give you a planned operating capacity, which uh, takes that into consideration. On the other hand, if some buildings have some uh, rooms that are vacant, we add that to the planned operating capacity. So bottom line is those two pieces of the project done, we have A, a look at enrollment and what it's gonna be. B, we have a look at the school's capacity and also taking into consideration uh, either overloads or uh, situations of uh, equity issues uh, and then C, the last part is we will be taking a look at the four um, various alternatives that you have listed as, as a part of uh, the, the four scenarios. And we also will be including an analysis of a possible uh, high school union with uh, Addison Northwest. And so there will be five, minimally five different alternatives that we will explore. And the thing we want to absolutely are dedicated to making sure that our analysis is objective. So with each of the options, we will provide to you an objective analysis of what we believe are the challenges the advantages associated with each option. So that's a that's a very important point. Uh, there is a there are a couple of other points that we wanted to make. One is that this does not uh, the study does not include a systems analysis, meaning we don't take in and and examine your furnaces or the pipes or things like that. But we do ask for information from the building principals and others concerning the condition of various uh, systems. And if there are any major system issues, we ask that we be notified. And we, we send a template to each principal 
with a list of questions with regard to that, with regard to class sizes, square footage, uh, you know, the uh, various uh, space utilization within uh, gym, cafeteria, art, science, so on, so that we get a complete and full uh, info on all of that, uh, you know, the roof or things along those lines. That's, uh, that's something we rely on. We also don't get into, uh, we do not do a safety security study. Uh, if something does come to our view, uh, we would certainly mention it, but that's not a key piece of the study. Uh, and so it's important for you folks to be aware of that. Uh, we don't do a cost analysis of what it would cost to add to a building or to replace parts of a building, but we do certainly mention if those are things that are needed and then you'd have to be talking to either an architect or someone who, who does that. So that's the, uh, that's the way it gets done. And once it's completed, uh, you folks would get a chance to review it. Uh, we would, you know, if, if there are some concerns, we would certainly address them. And then uh, we do a presentation uh, and also hard copies of the document. The presentation is usually done um, uh, in this particular case, given the world that we're living in now, it would be probably a video presentation, and I will guarantee you next time, uh, unfortunately, you would have to look at me. But uh, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, we, we make it work. Uh, we make it work. So um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, we will be able to do. And once we have received the templates from the principal, and before we have done all of this other uh, that I've just mentioned, we will be back several times in touch with the principal with follow-up questions, and we will ask the principal if there are some concerns that have been uh, expressed within the building, we will ask the principal either for a video walkthrough or for photographs that would show us what he had or she had talked about. So that way we have a clear view of what has taken place. Um, so that's essentially the, the process, and um, we have found it to be very successful. And uh, it, uh, you know, we, we believe and we are completely dedicated to making sure that it is accurate and that it, it provides key information to the district so they can move forward. So I'd be happy, uh, that's essentially the, uh, the process. So if there's anything, um, and you know, happy to answer any questions related to it. And, um, you know, or if I don't have the answer today, I would definitely get back to you uh, if I had to do a little bit more research. John, I, for, I, I apologize for not bringing this up earlier, but can you talk, talk to us a little bit about your background um, prior sure. to NESDAQ? Sure. I've been uh, with NESDEC for uh, well, going on 14 years. And I have uh, been primarily working uh, with them on uh, strategic planning, on um, the facility studies, best use studies, and on the enrollment projection portions. I have not been involved with them with the executive searches and uh, that that's another team that works on that. My prior background to that was I was a, um, uh, a teacher for uh, in uh, public schools for approximately uh, 25 plus years and then an administrator uh, with regard to uh, uh, instruction and planning uh, in a school district. I also was a department chair for a period of years while I was uh, continuing to teach. So I've had uh, uh, fairly extensive experience with the educational process and also uh, with NES NESDEC. Thank you. Yep. 
I think, um, uh, John, I'm, I'm remiss that um, the extent of our uh, public, so-called public uh, today is Krista Seringo, who is also on the school board and she is the chairman of the communications subcommittee that um, has done a lot of the work that um, you had um, had, uh, had a lot of positive things to say before. Um, I guess the other thing, Patrick, if, and if Krista remains the only person representing the public, I would ask the committee if she could just join in with Q&A um, as, as part of us if she so chooses. Is everyone okay with that? That's fine, That's fine with me. Yep. Thank you. And I, you know, if, if there's anything, any question that she has, um, you know, over the course of the next several weeks that uh, she feels need to be answered because she was not available today, uh, that's, that's fine. I'd be happy to uh, take a call from her or an email and respond. And the same would be true with you folks. I just promoted Krista to panelist, so she should have the same access everyone else does. So feel free to participate in, in any way you like, Krista. Video, no video, mute, unmute. John, this is Josh. I have a couple questions um, and apologies in advance if some of this has already been discussed um, before the meeting. Um, sure. First, uh, uh, that was a great um, intro and I was hoping that you could send us maybe, I don't know if you're reading from something, maybe you could send us something so we could uh, use it to incorporate to the meeting minutes and ease the meeting minute writing burden. Um, I don't know if you have anything available. Well, there's a, uh, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I kind of typed as you went and summarized, I think, the key points into the minutes. So if you okay. don't, right. don't worry about and, it. And the video is being recorded as well. So okay. we have that as a record. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that, 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 that's great. I didn't realize that was happening. Um, the first okay. the first question I have for you, John, is, um, you had, you had reviewed the four proposals that have been circulated among amongst the committee group, um, the, and I'm I'm assuming that the fifth option that sounds like the one the one option that was discussed last time we met. Were there any obvious alternates that we did not cap, capture in those that list? I don't I don't think there's anything obvious. Uh, what happens frequently is as we go into, first of all, we'll get the enrollment projections. I have looked at the info that you had, uh, that has been shared with me, and uh, looks like the uh, uh, enrollments are flat and, and uh, somewhat declining over a course of time. This would be K through 12. Uh, However, uh, you know, based on those projections that you folks had, uh, the, the, uh, but what we find is that when we take a look at the, and get the final info on the enrollments, and then when we go and get the templates back from the building principles and also uh, get a look at, you know, photos or uh, video of uh, problem areas, uh, we may come up with some other analysis um, that would lead to different options. But I think that the options, the four options that uh, you folks have uh, talked about initially uh, are things that are, I think would be certainly uh, things that we would look at and give consideration to. We often do see the uh, scenarios where uh, there might be a, a, a reconfiguration and movement of students from, uh, you know, one place to another, depending on the availability of space in a particular school. And uh, so that's a, uh, that's a factor that obviously comes up in a couple of, uh, of your uh, or possibly uh, uh, two or three of your uh, scenarios. So that's something we may come up with a different alternative and we don't, 
you know, it's, it's, you know, we would put it out there if we felt that, uh, after talking to you folks, uh, there was, uh, interest in it. Uh, but, uh, it looks like you've got four, uh, potential scenarios, uh, and we would, uh, we would take a look at all of those and we would give you what is our objective view in terms of what would be the challenges and the advantages associated with each. Okay, great. Kevin, we did have a, another community member join, Tori Riley, who's also a principal at one of our elementary schools. Um, I don't know if you want me to give her permission to speak, promote her to panelists. How would you like her involvement to look? It's fine. She, you know, um, certainly anytime she wants to uh, pose a question or uh, needs any additional information, be happy to help. I, um, is there anybody on the committee that would object to her joining? Nope. All right. I, think it, I think it could be advantageous to us. Great. Troy, I'll give you, uh, I'll promote you to panelists and you can participate in any way that you'd like. John, another question from you. Um, you had mentioned that no system analysis and no building analysis or facility analysis will be involved in your um, your analysis uh, in, a, in trying to establish parity. Did you, do you suggest that that is something that we establish outside of the forms that you're sending out to the to superintendent? No, I, I, the suggestion that we would have would be, let's, let's say that there is, uh, and we see this in, in uh, many of our site visits, let's say that somebody uh, were to say that the, uh, the heating system uh, in the building is inconsistent. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that's true in probably 80% of schools. But uh, if it's because the system is not functioning and there's a problem with the, uh, with the furnace or whatever might be the issue, uh, that's a different story. And that would be something we would note in our report. But then in terms of getting an indicator as to, uh, you know, what would be the cost of having it fixed or replaced or those types of things. Those would be the things that after the report comes out and provides you with details, uh, that would be something that, uh, you know, the school board would most likely have to determine whether they would uh, go forward and, and get a, a uh, you know, an estimate concerning what that would cost. So in other words, things like that, leaking roofs and things like that, we, we don't, uh, uh, in our report, uh, do research into what would be the cost of replacing a, uh, you know, the shingles on a roof. And John, when I when I was talking with Don early on in the process and trying to get a set, so Don Kennedy is uh, another um, sort of representative from NESDEC. And when I was exploring with him the possibility of the the variety of assessments that you guys do, um, he discouraged a, a sort of an arc, hiring an, uh, a, an architect firm to do a, a more in-depth facilities analysis initially because he said throughout your process, it may become clear which buildings don't make sense to continue to operate, in which case, why would we want to spend tens of thousands of dollars to do a facilities assessment on a building that becomes obvious that doesn't make sense to factor into the planning? Is that, is that consistent with your thinking? And am that's I absolutely, that's right on. And, and that's why, you know, this is a preliminary but it's uh, an important analysis because it provides you with uh, extensive detail, the specifics of some of the alternatives that may be required, especially with regard to maintenance uh, situations that 
that need to uh, may need to take place. And uh, so that's uh, to do that ahead of time and, and then find out that, uh, well, that's not something that you're going to move forward with because you're going to close the building or whatever it might be would make the, the project uh, extremely expensive to have mm. bring in, you know, Other questions? John, did you did you have, did you talk about timing with, with your involvement? Um, yes, uh, we are uh, thinking that in terms of the early stages, the demographic analysis, we would move forward on that um, shortly, uh, probably uh, uh, sometime in during this month, and. Uh, because the information is going to be uh, relatively uh, readily available. And then we would, uh, prior to a final presentation in, uh, let's say, November, uh, be after we have received the info on the 2020-21 uh, uh, enrollments, we would um, we would certainly update, and we always do update the demographic info that we have gained by recontacting folks just to see if there have been any major changes in the info that they had provided to us. And based on that information, uh, what we you would see both the enrollment projection for that alternative with regard to grade levels and schools. And you would also see the capacity analysis and it would be up to date. I think Floyd had a question. Thanks, John. I, I'm just curious if you're working as a team to have any modeling or projecting on the, on the short term impact of what COVID might do for enrollment. I know for us here in Vermont, so much of our budgets are based on uh, enrollment and it can shift so drastically in a, in a small school. Um, is, there, is there anything that you guys are doing in, in that area that might be helpful for us as well? Well, the, the analysis that we have um, is obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's based on the actual enrollments and also uh, statistical information that we gain with regard to changing demographics. Uh, however, the, the uh, uh, different uh, uh, impacts of coronavirus uh, are believed to, we believe that, that uh, it's going to be uh, short term in terms of overall impact on, on uh, school enrollments. And um, the point that we also make is that almost any uh, alternative that we provide to a district uh, is certainly one which is going to require a major, uh, any, any type of restructuring of facilities or things along those lines, uh, the timeline is most likely going to be at least a couple of years for that alternative to be implemented, whatever it might be, unless it's a, you know, leave all as is. And so it's, um, you know, by that time, a couple of years down the road, we, we think that the uh, impacts of the uh, corona uh, virus and the pandemic are going to be uh, not as uh, not as uh, strong as they will appear to be over the course of the next six months. And any thoughts in terms of over the longer term with migration away from urban urban areas into a more rural area and is there any way to factor any any projection or current information on that on our numbers going forward? Well, 
That's something we are going to be taking a look at over the course of the next several months. But I can tell you that we have just completed uh, a study or are in the process of completing a study with a very small uh, Massachusetts district. And the realtors have been telling us that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, many folks have been seeking uh, to exit major cities. And uh, especially, obviously, people who are uh, of uh, the boomer generation, but also the millennials. And uh, the millennials are a major factor in uh, the purchase of single family homes. Now, finally, now, because the millennial generation, as I'm sure you all know, was very slow to uh, marry and very slow to have children. And however, now the oldest of them are reaching their late 30s. And many of them, realtors are telling us, many of them are, you know, aggressive buyers on the market today because they had been living in apartments or whatever, and now are looking for single family homes. And the other piece is uh, the, the price range for millennials uh, that, that is most on the national level and regionally that is, that is most appealing is under the 260, 300 range uh, because many of them still have college debt. And so it's, uh, you know, it's a factor that kicks in and it affects both their uh, application approval for mortgages and also, uh, you know, they just have a certain amount of money that they, they want to spend. But uh, we are seeing finally that the millennial generation, especially those in their early 30s, are becoming strong buyers. So in answer to that question, uh, you know, there are some factors. People are moving out of cities and uh, the millennials are moving to places that are uh, affordable. More more so than some of the ones. I mean, prices in, <laughs> we, we just went through this with a, a study, but uh, prices uh, for single family homes uh, in Hingham, Massachusetts, uh, in price is now over a an easy commute to Boston. And so people are paying that kind of money for a single family home if it happens to be 20 minutes outside of the city and in a place that's on the water. Uh, this is Jeff. Can I ask a couple of quick questions? If nobody sure. Um, just listening between the lines, you said something about videos of problem areas in schools. Are, are you going to be making site visits to these schools or are you going to rely on these uh, t principal templates and videos? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's likely at this stage that we will be relying on the photos and the videos depending on what the circumstances are uh, in the fall. Uh, it, it depends on what occurs in, in the schools and, and uh, no one, uh, at least uh, I haven't heard it and nobody on our team has heard that there have been definitive uh, decisions made as of yet uh, with regard to how uh, student enrollments are going to be uh, finally accommodated. So I understand it must be uh, most informative for you to visit a school when it's in session so you can see how the facility interacts with uh, humans or vice versa. But even if the building is empty, wouldn't it be a lot more informative to look at an empty building than to look at a video of an empty building? 
Well, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a possibility, and the decision would have to be made once we see uh, how this, uh, you know, how this rolls out over the course of the next uh, two months and before school starts. Um, we, you know, certainly are considering that, and that has been our norm but we also wanted to have available a possible alternative in the event that, uh, you know, there are still these issues within the, uh, within the school buildings. And then I was wondering, um, with regard to your target due date of November, Patrick, how does that work for you with the other things that you need to tie into the facilities planning process? Um, the, the, we've talked about this maybe a little bit here, but maybe more at the community engagement committee level and some of the board level. Um, it, I mean, I recognize the timing is what it is. I think it's, it's delayed from what it would have been had we not had COVID-19, um, because NESDEC might've been able to get in this spring and see schools in session, et cetera. Um, and it's something we'll have to work with and we can work with, but it, it does create the, the possible the possibility of a log jam uh, in terms of if I picture November, we're in budget building cycle for FY22. We are um, talking about long term planning with our facilities related to this study and possibly in a position of having to make some short term significant decisions to get an FY22 budget that will pass. So I, I see this. Um, was actually talking with a building principal earlier today. The November, December, January window um, in the fall and into the winter is going to be a really, really, really interesting, we'll say, mm -hmm. time as all of those things converge. So I guess I'm wondering, John, if, um, I mean, I, to, in my mind, and I don't do what you do, so I don't know the answer, it would seem to me to, that a site visit would be extremely important. But if the site visit isn't going to happen anyway, <clears throat> then is there a reason why your report couldn't be brought forward because it doesn't make any difference whether the kids are in the buildings or not. You're going to look at videos which can be done anytime. Well, that's, that's true, but what, what we wanted to try to, what we wanted to try to uh, do and hold off on uh, was uh, we know that uh, Vermont has had a much lower uh, level of uh, impact in terms of, uh, you know, uh, actual c confirmed cases than many other parts of the country. And we were thinking that, um, you know, we didn't want to rule out completely a site visit that, uh, if when we get to the fall, the there are indicators that we could do that. And so uh, what we said, I believe in the proposal was it is likely that this would be difficult, meaning uh, the site visit would be difficult or challenging. Therefore, we wanted to provide an alternative that would give us the information that we would need. And so uh, that's why we came up with the remote site visit alternative. And we were thinking that we would till, you know, better as to where things stand within the school district so that we could make a final determination along those lines. And from my perspective, you know, the, as much as it, as it creates what could be a log jam in the fall and early winter, um, you know, looking at at the trend, like we're we're trending pretty favorably right now, so it's it makes sense to me that we we give this some time to develop and see what the fall might look like. Because if giving it a couple of months to see how the fall might play out, if that opens up an opportunity for a site visit with kids in buildings to some capacity. Um, because this information is going to have an impact on decisions that will last years and years, I think it's worth giving it those few months and giving it the time it needs to 
be as thorough in this process as we can, while also recognizing that you know we are we're on the precipice of a financial crisis, um, or or in the midst of one. I guess that's a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there's there's some time sensitivity to this, but I think a couple of months it's worth letting that play out to try and get the best information we can. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Anybody else have questions, comments? I got, I've got just a couple. I've just got a couple of things. I, I'd like to make, I'll make a comment. And John, before you were talking, we've given you these four scenarios and you seem to see that they hold water to some degree, but you may come up with some other ones, but I, I think we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we, we don't want to preconceive your activity with these four scenarios either. These were sort of started out um, through our planning community engagement process as here's some things that um, Patrick and his administration had started off with and it's a good point of discussion. And for maybe they're brilliant to begin with because there's been not a lot of modification or a lot of um, punting or kicking of the tires and changing things on them. But um, I would think we would certainly want to be open, um, you know, to have you kick the tires on those, but also be open-minded about maybe there's something else that um, may transpire or there's an amalgamation of some of those um, scenarios as well. And I guess the the question the question for you would be, uh, we're we're doing some preliminary footwork, um, and at some point we will be engaging with, um, you know, engineering services, architectural services to go to the next step. What is your experience, or what do you foresee um, the peel off or the 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 phase down of your work and the phase up of a of an architectural firm, and what sort of a handshake, what sort of a follow on um, activity do you sometimes have? Well, the, the, uh, we have worked uh, on several occasions with architectural firms uh, to provide the information and uh, then they, you know, they take it from there. But essentially the piece that we think is important is that the, the district be able to take a look at these alternatives and anything else that we come up with. Uh, and there may be, depending on what we see as we, as we go through, uh, for alternatives. And then to analyze within the district and within your committee uh, first, and probably then the district, what the uh, what the most likely alternative or two alternatives might be that you would want to go forward with. And then it might make sense at that point to, uh, you know, uh, contact an architectural firm and come to some type of agreement for a follow up uh, piece based on that. But uh, we, we have found uh, with numerous districts that, you know, it's much better to get the analysis done uh, and much less expensive. Uh, and then we can say, well, this is, you know, these are your challenges and your advantages out of this option. And the district may say, you know, that's just, and there are some instances where we have indicated that we do not feel that a an option, a particular option is viable. And uh, if we feel that, uh, you know, that it's just absolutely would not work because of whatever the circumstances are, uh, we would make that known to the district in advance. And so it's uh, uh, probably less, less costly uh, and more efficient way of moving things forward so that you're able to narrow it down to just a, an option or two uh, before you have to enlist the uh, services of an architectural firm. Agreed. 
says the architect. Well, it's just, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of, uh, you know, having to, having to deal with, uh, uh, you know, five potential options or it, uh, going back to your earlier uh, study where you had the uh, community involvement, uh, I think there were uh, seven or more that were initially considered. So there's already been a narrowing process. Does anybody else have any other questions for John? It's- uh, uh, I have one more, this is Jeff. This is Josh again. Um, John, we're, we're in a very odd time in the world. Things are changing quickly. Um, I don't know what your deliverable looks like specifically. Uh, are you doing a phased recommendation potentially um, at, you know, during, you know, in, in the first year, maybe some initial met recommendations to close the gap. Um, and then what it looks like uh, in five years or 10 years, do you do that type of stuff where we can look down or look into the crystal ball and see what that means to go down one route? In terms of enrollments? I'm leaving the question. I'm, I'm, I'm in terms of the enrollments, do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our enrollment solutions. projections our enrollment projections usually provide a 10 year uh, sequence by grade level for okay. the district. And so that would also, you know, give you an indicator with regard to schools in the district. And obviously the first five years are the most accurate. Uh, you know, they, they have a pretty good record of accuracy, but the fi first five years are the most accurate because you're dealing with, we know what the births are, and therefore you right. have a pretty good look at what your classes are going to look like. And we also have a pretty good indicator in terms of what uh, residential growth will take place and also uh, what the situation will be with existing home sales and so on. Whereas when you get, you know, beyond five years out, uh, all of those things become less uh, accurate. Certain. Okay. But you'll get a 10 Thank year. You. Yeah, okay. And you'll also get a 10 year history of enrollments, which you've, looks like you've already pretty well done anyway. Yeah. Well, I think we're it, uh, if we look at the agenda and try to keep to our time schedule, we're pretty much at the end of the discussion. If anybody else has any final questions, we can briefly do them or else we can thank John and um, continue with our agenda. Before, before you go on, I just wanted to say if there's, uh, if uh, I hope this was helpful and I hope that it provided you with a, a clear look at the process. And uh, so I, I, you know, if, if you had any questions that that were indicators that it was, uh, you know, you needed more information, just let me know. But uh, uh, you could always uh, either through the superintendent or uh, contact me and uh, I'd certainly be, our team would be happy to, uh, you know, provide any additional info if you need it. Well, I think um, we're all quiet here. There's a little bit of chirping going on, but we certainly appreciate your time and it's been very insightful. Um, and we look forward to working with you. Okay, well, we're looking forward to, to it as well. And uh, we will uh, certainly be back in touch very soon. And uh, we, we try to communicate frequently. And I hope you all get to enjoy the sunshine a little bit. I can see some sun in a couple of the windows there. So I'm thinking that must be out. <laughs> John, it was great to meet you. Thank you very much. Okay, John. Nice to meet you all. Take care. Have Take a care. good one. Bye now.
Bye now. So moving on with the agenda, um, we've got member comments and commit public comments, I think. Um, we probably we could combine them and just go around the table and give everybody their three minutes on a soapbox. Uh, let's see, um, where should we start? Krista, do you have anything to add? Guess that's not Josh, or what? Nope, she just she just unmuted. Maybe just unmuted. Krista, but we can't hear you if you're speaking, Krista. I'm not sure. Oh, audio is not working for some reason okay. in the chat. Krista, if you if you want to. Um, type your comments into the chat, we can go around the horn a little bit and I'll make sure to read what you've typed. That way I can give you a chance to type in there and we can have your voice heard that way. Okay, Josh. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanna reiterate that the process that I've observed has been really holistically positive and um, bringing on um, John at this time is uh, really good and I agree with his assessment that getting a design, you know, an architect in the facilities, I think that's spot on. Um, decide what you want to do first that's uh, consistent with population movements and then make some smart decisions. Um, I, I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to, uh, to understand better um, what that all means, but uh, I guess that all come out in John's report, and um, which is great. Um, I am a little bit concerned about timing but um, I'm available if, if meetings need to be, happen more frequently than once a month. So that, that's all I have to say. Okay, Jeff. Um, I, I, I guess I, I also am a little bit concerned about timing. I reread the uh, advisory facility studies committee guidelines and the essential questions before this meeting just to refresh my recollection on what they asked there's a lot of really deep work that needs to be done to answer those questions and if we don't get the report till november i think it's uh it's going to be really hard but you know i have i'm the new guy here uh <laughs> So, so, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that, but as Josh said, you know, um, I'll make as much time available as we need to. Um, but it looks like, it looks like this report, which is preliminary to all those essential questions is really, that's just going to be the start of our work. And maybe just a point of clarification around the, those essential questions. Um, NESDEC's work will answer some of them, and many of those questions are, are not questions that NESDEC would be answering. They're questions that we'd have to answer with internal folks and internal informa information, perhaps consulting with somebody else, um, but mostly those are for us to, to find the answers to. Yeah. It helps yeah. with the timing a little bit because we can control that a little bit more. Yeah. Sarah? Um, I found that really informative. I didn't watch because it just looked like a camera. So I just typed as uh, he went. Hopefully that comes out okay. Um, so I did, I think I was actually pretty thorough, even though I said I wouldn't be. Um, I, I'm actually not that worried about timing. I kind of feel like all of, you know, once they get started, I, I believe they're going to start asking all these questions and that we will be, if, you know, the, the team will be answering it and there are some things we can't answer. Um, so I don't, that they're going to answer or Patrick's going to help answer. Um, and I think it's going to be fine. 
it'll be, I agree November will be crazy, but I'm not going to worry about it, I think. I think it'll be okay. I don't know. Thank you. Katrina? I too found that to be very informative. I, I feel like we've made a great choice in working with this organization for sure. Um, and I too am trying not to panic about things months from now when it's, it's easy to panic about things today. So I think we'll, we've got the right people on board. We're gonna keep this momentum going and we'll adjust if we need to get together more often as more information is needed to move us along. I think we're, we're doing all right. Thank you, uh, Floyd. Thanks, yeah, I'm excited about the 10 year projection on, on numbers. You know, we, we've been going the last few budget cycles with showing that downward trend. And, and I like having an outside voice coming in to be able to really say, hey, it's, it's, it, it is what it is, um, whatever that is. I mean, if we've been totally wrong and it's gonna turn and our number's gonna come up, that's, that would be good information to find. But um, I think that being able to drive that, drive that home a little bit as we're going through these next budget cycles, this one coming up, and then really the one after that just as, as much, having this will be um, probably even more important in the facility side and best use. Thank you. Patrick? Um. Yeah, I, I agree. We're going to get a lot of really useful information from an unbiased outside source that I think is going to be hugely valuable. Um, and I actually think, I'm thinking very seriously about, so we're not currently a member of NESDEC. Um, some other districts in our region are. And so they, they do an annual um, enrollment study. So they would keep that information fresh and, and kind of roll as, as as things change in our communities and whatnot. So I'm, I'm seriously thinking about becoming a member and, and I wanna give a lot of credit to, to the NESDEC team. Uh, there's a 20% discount for membership, for, for members for these studies that because we're sort of partnering with Addis Northwest a bit and we're looking at this a little more holistically, they're extending that 20% discount to us. So, um, you know, I'd give them a lot of credit for doing that when they don't have to, because it feels like the right thing to do. And, and I think there is, as he mentioned, you know, 10 years is, you know, a number of districts with them for 10 years or more. I think it's because they're getting good information. And that's what I'm hearing from my superintendent colleagues. So I'm excited about continuing to get that information going forward. Um, and I agree that the timing is unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. And I'm not panicked a bit. It's going to, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be, um, Emotional is going to be a lot of things rolled into it, but the reason I don't, I'm not panicking is be, and this is why I don't panic almost ever. And those that have worked with me <laughs> can attest to that. I, I have absolutely no idea where this is going to take us, but I am 100% confident we've built systems and structures and processes, and we have the right people around the right tables to engage in the kind of work that's going to need to happen going forward. And that gives me great, um, great confidence in our ability to receive the information, digest it, process it with our community. We have an outstanding community engagement committee that has set the stage for this really well and will continue to do so. And I'll read, I have Krista's comments here that I can read that kind of speak to this a bit as well. Um, and it, not that it won't be challenging, it won't be messy at times, but I feel confident that we're gonna come out of this with something that's gonna work for us. So. I'm not panicked. Thank, thank you. I briefly, um, I, I, I think these guys are a great find. Um, and I've been impressed with, through looking at their proposals, even the discussion today with the quality and thoroughness of their um, investigation, if you will. Um, I was initially, I, I won't say disappointed, but I had to have a correction in my assumptions because I thought we would end up further than we will at the end of their report. But their report um, or their deliverable, if you will, um, will set us with some very objective information that will either confirm um, our assumptions or um, 
point us in a better direction. So I, I think this is a wise step. And I understand, I understand the, the hesitancy with, with timing and whatnot, but um, you gotta, you gotta walk um, down a narrow path and make sure that um, they're, they're, um, we're doing the right thing. And there may be some intermediate corrections through on, on that path as well. So um, I think that's, my kind of my comments on it. Um, so in closing, I, I think Kevin, I do have uh, Krista's comments. She typed them into the oh, chat. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and I will add in terms of the timing again, we're getting pretty accustomed to not having all the information we wish we had while we have to make some really hard decisions. That's something we do on an annual basis around budget building time. So <laughs> for whatever that's worth, we've got some practice. <laughs> Um, so Krista's comments, she says, I look forward to hearing more from John's team. I wonder if there should be any messaging out to the community about the hiring of John's team and commencement of that work. It might also be good to think about where, uh, where there will be opportunity for community input to set some sort of guideposts or timeline so that folks know that the opportunities will be coming. So case in point that we have, that those are great comments and, and I think about the relationship between this committee and the community engagement committee, um, ensuring that we we have that kind of communication and that kind of community interaction throughout this process. So that feels great. Should we consider in one of these meetings going forward before this report comes and, and as a way to get this information, bring bring some members of that community engagement committee into, into this meeting, invite them so that they kind of get that 10,000 foot level of what we're trying to do and they might be able to give us some advice based on what they've gotten for feedback from the community to help help frame some of the questions we need to ask John. And that's something you know what's going through my mind with that Kevin so we have it might be scheduled for this week on Thursday. Thursday. So Kevin as the chair of this subcommittee, Krista as the chair of the community engagement subcommittee, Don as the chair of the board, and myself meeting with our consultant that's been working with us through the fall to talk through exactly that. Like what's the linkage here and how do we move forward in a really sort of symbiotic way that, um, that is keeping everybody in the loop and engaging the community and moving this work forward. So I, I'm really looking forward to that conversation about how that happens. Thank you. Um, so in, in closing, um, or something I lost my train of thought, but anyway, I guess at this point we're pretty much at the time that we need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Can you tell me who just right. said that? I don't, I can't see. Josh Let's moved see. and uh, Jeff seconded. Sorry. Who, I'm sorry, say it again. Josh moved and Jeff seconded. Thank you. And it was about to be unanimous, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So the next, oh, I know what it was. Next meeting, scheduled meeting is Monday, 7-6. So it'll be right after the non-fourth, um, same time, three o'clock. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.